The gala opening of the Cultural Center of the Philippines on the 8th of September 1969 attracted throngs of protesters, both for and against the event. David Medaglia, as an artist, had received an invitation, and as an artist, he mounted a performance of his own. Along with Marciano Galang and Jun Lansang, he arrived at the center early and positioned himself on the balcony overlooking the grand lobby where the presidential couple, Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, along with their guests, Ronald and Nancy Reagan, would soon arrive. Medallia and his companions unfurled handmade protest signs that read, We want a home, not a fascist tomb. Reagan, go home. And down with Philistines. When police tried to make him leave, he brandished his invitation and insisted, We have come here as artists. This is a work of art, and I have every right to exhibit it here, in the home of the arts. This incident was emblematic of David Medaglia as someone who, throughout his life, was continually crossing boundaries, not only to defy imposed social and political constraints, but to redefine what art could be. He loved to tell stories. He loved to tell fables. He loved to tell draw attention of his audience to persons of significance in the past from whom we could learn uh, good things. But those were his recurrent themes: no historical figures, historical narrative, the ideas of um, inequality in relationships, or the ideas of equality, reciprocal uh, relations. He always had to have a collaborator with him. No, when it wasn't a person, he was collaborating with a statue. So this is the way he would tell stories through his performances. David Medaglia Jr. was born on the 23rd of March, 1938, in Singalong, Manila, the second of five children. Some four years later, in 1942, the Medaglia family home in Singalong was destroyed by Japanese forces moving to occupy the capital. From the center of the damaged city, the family relocated to its periphery. They made their new home in Ermita on a Mabini Street. Growing up in the aftermath of a war that had appended people's lives and devastated the city, the young David Medaglia was not hindered by any borders. He was a voracious reader who fell in love with poetry, art, and beauty. At 15, he began to have his poetry published in various weekly magazines. Publications like the official University of the Philippines paper, the Philippine Collegian, as well as the campus journal of the UP journalism class, highlighted him on the front page, although they did not grant his request to have his picture printed upside down. His abilities so impressed then-UP President Vidal Tan that the teenage Medaglia was able to enroll in the College of Liberal Arts without a high school diploma. On recommendation from his professors, Medaglia soon received a travel grant to study in New York, where he enrolled in Columbia University, taking classes in poetry classical literature, drama, music, and philosophy. The New York-based poets and painters he met inspired him, and he started drawing and painting in earnest. When he returned to the Philippines, he turned his family home on Mabini Street into his studio, where he would paint and give art lessons, as well as host artist gatherings and symposiums. The Medaglia residence became a kind of artist's salon and literary retreat, which he dubbed La Cave d'Angeli, or Cave of Angels. The celebrated Catalan poet Jaime Hill de Biedma was among the luminaries who alighted in this cave and struck up a friendship with Medaglia. In his diary, 
Hilde Biedma recorded the exhilaration of dancing with Medalia and his friends during an impromptu jam session at La Cave d'Angeli. Among this free-spirited crowd, Medalia was in his element. But he would not remain ensconced in the country of his birth. Just like art and literature, travel for him was a means of expanding one's consciousness and making sense of the world. In 1960, he relocated from Manila to London, where he very quickly made a name for himself in the city's avant-garde art scene. Through the following decades, while spending time in both the Philippines and the UK, he traveled extensively through Europe, Asia, and Africa. He attempted to trace poet Arthur Rimbaud's final years in France and journeyed to Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Indochina, Singapore, and Egypt. He continued to create art, honing himself and being inspired by artists in urban centers around the world. Part of the reason for this incessant travel was because he had a Philippine passport and could only get visas to stay within England or France for up to three months at a time. For him, his wanderings did not make him an exile. He had said that, I've always felt at home wherever I was wherever I found myself, at any given moment of time. People have always questioned why um, he never returned to the Philippines for a longer or more substantial time. It's that I think he found in, and I find it too, even living in Berlin, not really speaking German uh, very badly, um, that sometimes to be the outsider gives you a much more romantic view of the culture in which you're embedded. And being an outsider gives you the privilege of not having to attain uh, uh, or aspire to, let's say, an unholy alliance with an art establishment or, or, or a particular gallery. It, it's very, very liberating in that sense. A lot of his works evoke his time in the Philippines, evoke friendships he'd forged in the Philippines, and also the music. You know, music for his performance art was very central because it guided a lot of the different things that had to happen. You know, it moved the story along and it was music. And inevitably, it would be Filipino music. Okay, I'm not saying all his performance art is like that. I'm just saying some of his work is like that. You can see it never left him. Dave was very, very, very proudly a Filipino. He never gave up his passport, even when I'd suggested to him, Dave, why not take a residency, at least a, a dual, dual citizenship in England, or just make life because of our traveling the world together. We had so many times when we just had to stand outside in the cold and the wind and the rain, and that's not an exaggeration, at seven o'clock in the morning in long queues of people waiting for visas. Um, there were those times where um, I really begged him. I said, why not? And he said, no, I'm a Filipino through and through, and I'll remain a Filipino. And I don't want my identity lost in a kind of a colonial structure. I'm a proud Filipino, and I stand by Rizal, and I stand as a proud Filipino. As Medallia's close friend Juntera shared, even if he loved the Philippines, David was never parochial. He admired, loved, learned, understood, and imbibed some of the best aspects of other cultures and civilizations. That is why his art has the profundity, complexity, and magnitude, and inventiveness that baffles those, especially in the commercial art world, who try to package and sell art as commodities. He was a humanist and cosmopolitan in the deepest sense of the word, and this comes out in the universality of his artworks. They cannot be defined by national boundaries. 
Even as he explored the world, he also explored the possibilities of art. In the 1960s, as he began to embrace kinetic art, he had the aim of creating sculptures that were continually expanding or changing in unpredictable ways. This was not possible using conventional materials, nor with the rote or repetitive movements of most mechanical kinetic sculptures. To realize his vision, he essentially had to create a new form of sculpture. This was a daunting scientific as well as philosophical challenge. The results were the bubble machines that became his best known and most acclaimed series of works, the Cloud Canyons. These consisted simply of a large tube or tubes mounted vertically on a stand. When the mechanism was turned on, soapy water was pumped through the tubes and spewed forth as rising columns of foam or floating clouds, growing and collapsing in front of the viewer. Medaglia referred to these installations as auto-creative sculptures, continually reshaping and reconfiguring themselves with the flow of the bubbles. He was always very innovative. He was creative to the fullest sense of the word. What I think was probably, for me, very big was his cloud canyons. I love the, the idea of the machine creating itself, uh, creating something it's influenced by the humidity, by is there some wind that's coming in, so it changes shapes and all that. And it, what is nice about this uh, cloud canyons is that it continually creates and changes and things like that. One is his very nuanced use of material, something very ordinary, like liquid soap that, that creates bubbles. But it has become, it, he has given it a very expressive quality. Of course, he would also relate that to his experiences during the, the Japanese occupation. He would tell stories about seeing soldiers, uh, witnessing soldiers dying. So there is a connection to that, the, the bubble machine brings back those memories. And so it's interesting how he, he puts those very traumatic experiences into something that's very light and ethereal you know, in a way. His participatory work of called A Stitch in Time, that is also very significant because I think uh, he does not put art in a very high, inaccessible ivory tower. He asks people to participate, to join, and together, the togetherness of, of even ordinary people creates something that is significant, that could be even beautiful. I'd say his stitch in time and, uh, and the cloud canyons, even though uh, a lot of people say yun ng yun, but that it, they are really, for me, really monuments. I think we can underscore here his curiosity, his uh, never-ending creativity. I'm not really, a, I wouldn't call myself a sculptor because a sculptor is one who shapes things out of whatever was there. I shape things more out of my head. The first Cloud Canyons was shown at Signals, the London Art Gallery that Medaglia co-founded and which would have a seismic effect on the British art scene. Organizers of exhibitions and art fairs included him and eventually featured him in their shows, despite the difficulties in documenting his work due to his nomadic lifestyle. Curator Harold Zeman invited him to participate in Weiss Alf Weiss in 1966. When attitudes become form in 1969, both in Switzerland, and the Documenta 5 exhibition in Germany in 1972. 
from the playfulness of his kinetic machines using bubbles, sand, and mud, he began to venture into incorporating people and their movement in his art. More and more, he strove to bridge the gap between spectator and artwork by involving the spectators themselves in the creation of the work, in what would come to be labeled as participation art. For one of his best known works of this type, he would suspend fabric or wires from a gallery ceiling and invite viewers to add their own stitching or to attach anything they liked. This installation, known as a stitch in time, was first shown in London in 1968 and was mounted again several times over the years. The friendship developed when we were both in Europe. I think that that's probably where we started to get together. But I think he also knew about me, so, uh, you know, Magkabituka and the same interests in art. And of course, you cannot help but really have big admiration for David. I must have met David in about the winter of 2010 when I had gone to London to um, ask him whether he would allow me to do a book on his life and his art. And David didn't know where I was coming from because he wasn't quite sure why an art publisher, most especially in the Philippines, would want to sort of commercialize or make known his work. And he told me he was an anti-establishment figure in the British mainstream and that he had actually been ostracized. And he wasn't quite sure whether I was part of a movement to commodify him or to hang his art in white-walled galleries. So it was a quite tense meeting, I would say. Well, I was quite surprised. Uh, David had proposed that I would just follow him in a series of encounters to learn more about him. And then I found out he wasn't interested at all in my project. Instead, he wanted to gossip like most Filipinos, and he enjoyed chismis. So we spent a lot of time reminiscing about his great loves. And his current love, and the last one, was named Adam Nankervis and that David was very proud. He told me that he was the first Pinoy to enter into a same-sex partnership with Adam. And then he quickly added that it was part of a performative art exhibit, which sort of left me confused. So I just decided that I would have to hang on and discover more about my subject. Describing him as a pioneer of participation art in England, art historian Frank Popper wrote that Medallia was one of the few artists to successfully combine political involvement with conceptual art. Medallia's explorations gave him a broad view of global political and social issues and empowered him to express these realities as he found them. His dramatic protest against the Marcos regime alongside Marciano Galang and Jun Lansang during the opening of the Cultural Center of the Philippines was one of many such expressions. He worked with fellow artists in bringing participation art to the streets, often accompanied with typed statements of intention aimed at raising political awareness. Driven to explore the correlation between political and artistic participation, as well as to nurture the potential of creators, Medallia organized gatherings of politically aware artists. One such group was Exploding Galaxies, consisting mostly of young people with a rebellious energy, living and working together. Later, he formed Artists for Democracy, with whom he performed down with the slave trade, a street art event in London and Birmingham in 1971. Medallia rejected consumeristic society and an acquisition-driven art world. His outspokenness had repercussions on his career. For decades, his works were not included in the Tate Gallery's exhibitions or collections of kinetic art. 
Finally, in 2012, Tate Britain exhibited one of his cloud canyons as part of Migrations, an exhibition examining the role of migrant artists in England to coincide with the London Olympics. The inspiration was very much uh, all my own experiences. During the war, I saw as a toddler, young man shot and he was dying. And I saw bubbles coming out of his mouth, you know, the bubbles like those that you can see. And then much later, my mother uh, was cooking special meals for me with uh, cream of coconut. So I also saw bubbles. Then when I first went to America, I saw from above the air, I saw all these clouds, you know. So we were flying over the Pacific Ocean, the Grand Canyon, and over New York. And finally, my final inspiration was when I was in Edinburgh with a friend of mine. We went to uh, a brewery, you know, and we got free beer. We were slightly uh, inebriated. We went down from the castle to lie on our backs on King Arthur's seat, and as I was watching the clouds, I got the idea for this kind of work. The migration is because this was, the experiences came from different moments in my life, from being in the Philippines, being in New York, being in Scotland, being in England, being in France, you know, all the while thinking about clouds and their formations, which are never the same. Not content to transcend boundaries on his own, Medaglia encouraged others to do so as well, with installations like A Stitch in Time and Porcelain Wedding. He eliminated the boundary between art and audience, essentially inviting the viewers to be collaborators in creating the artwork. In the 1990s, as an homage to renowned Dutch painter Piet Mondrian, he launched the secret history of the Mondrian Fan Club, a series of collaborative art events that included handing out chrysanthemums to people at the cemetery in Brooklyn where the painter is buried and posing with skywriting of the letter M drawn in the sky above New York. These were done with his partner and longtime artistic collaborator Adam Nancurvis. Medaglia put on performances and impromptus, wittily combined with historical and artistic references. Many of these events in venues around Europe, Asia, the United States, and Africa were never recorded. And yet he would never bemoan this lack of documentation as a loss of art. These ephemeral pieces could simply be created anew by himself and his co-participants. French art critic Pierre Restigny described David Medaglia as the marginal artist par excellence. The word marginal used to refer to something that exists outside of or is excluded from the mainstream of a society is a word that consistently emerges when people try to characterize Medaglia's over and career. a Filipino who lived and worked in Manila and London, an artist who understood where the lines had been drawn and still traversed them as he saw necessary. With his life and art, he proved that such strictures really only exist where human beings draw them within their hearts and minds. Using what resources he had, he continued to explore his world and distill it into artistic expression. Despite the difficulties he faced, he was also able to encounter ideas and possibilities that would otherwise not be easily accessible. I think what I've learned from David was fortitude. He, he, is one, he was one of the most courageous, not even artists, courageous men I ever met in my life. And I learned that from his fortitude, his, his courage to just continue to live a life engaged with art, not always been easy. He's, he has slept in the streets, he's been thrown out of neighborhoods, he's been um, really 
through hard times, he kept doing his art. It was his salvation, in fact. Greatest legacy was, I believe, once people get to know his art, they will realize he really lived it. Okay, he would see art in the most mundane objects, in the most mundane activities in life. In the past few years, he made sure to uh, collaborate with young artists, and that was really something that we appreciated, especially the artists no, who collaborated with him, like Leslie De Chavez, Poklong Anading, um, and MMU. I think that generosity you know, that has always been a part of, of his art practice, um, and that has created a you know, community of, of artist friends. Uh, all over the world. What I have learned from David is it's also a Pinoy thing. We make do with what we have. Like he creates uh, this participatory artwork with people stitching in and putting in things in a, putting, uh, attaching things in a, in a, a cloth that he has uh, uh, laid out use what we have on hand and make the best out of it. That's what I personally have learned from him. And I wish I had the same amount of uh, curiosity and uh, creativity that David continually showed. For me, uh, really an icon. I cannot express fully his importance as a Filipino artist, not only for the Philippines, but also for the world. And I hope that um, the Philippines will recognize him too, as the world has already recognized him. My long-term interest in David Medallia was inspired by my late great mother, Esther Vival. At that time, I was working for her corporate philanthropy, Vival Foundation. And she made a critical but jesting remark that all my art books had fo just focused on dead male Filipino artists. And she suggested that I look further afield at expatriate Filipino artists who crossed convention, culture, and borders. And she mentioned names like Fernando Thobel, Alfonso Osorio, and David Medallia, who greatly impressed her during her time at the Manila Times when he was announced to be a poet approaching genius. And my mother, a very shrewd judge of character, compared him favorably to Ninoy Aquino, the very young Korean war journalist. She both claimed that both were mayabang and ilusionado. And that is how I got to know David Medallia. Truly, David Medallia has made an impact in the art world. Traveling the world and being at the center of several landmark artistic movements. He was an artist who defied convention, classification, or national identification, and whose work encompasses visual, kinetic, performance, conceptual, participatory, and avant garde art. Vibal Foundation documented all these and more with the publication of The Life and Art of David Medallia in 2012. This book featured Medallia's early years, over, and major milestones, and ultimately introduced his legacy to the world, one that is deserving of recognition, not just by the local, but also the international art scene. I think once the, the world um, has a true view of Dave, not as an enigma, but to see the true source of all his inspirations, of all his inner dialogues, and, and see it mapped out, um, I think his legacy will be very profound and shift some perspectives um, within the art world and how the art market and the art world attach to credibility and um, Acknowledgement, and I think Dave is dawning into to some something of quite a re revelation to a, a new broader audience than what he permitted within his own lifetime. So, I'm 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 
I'm excited for Dave. Hopefully, that David will he get to know him as much as he is in England or, or in Germany. He'll, he'll be as known as well in, in the Philippines. I think that was always his hope. So let's try to make that happen. I better look at the uh, Florentine art again, so I found the book. And there's a beautiful one of the, uh, the Primavera of, 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 of Botticelli. And it's a beautiful analysis by somebody who is a, probably a poet. Said, you know, when you look at this painting of Botticelli, it is about the, the breeze, la brisa. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 somebody's coming at Primavera, at the beginning of breeze. And this painting is, is like a scroll, like a Chinese scroll. And I said, that's so strange because somebody is coming in at one end and then blew, blowing, and there's another guy rushing this way. This is Hermes, Mercurio. But if you take it around, it's actually the breeze. If you roll it, I just, I'm, I was amazed. I mean, you know, that is the breeze that made this painting, La Brisa. The air, you know, that is great art. It's not because it's pretty, it's, it's used by Coco Chanel, to so it's very, it is it's such a beautiful, I said, well, I have to go, but next time I go to Florence, I must go to the Uffizi again, <laughs> because that's one thing, and that's very true, you know, that we should realize that all art is really interrelated that way, yes, but in, and to create new art again and again and again and again. Today, David Medaglia is best known for his kinetic and participatory art in the 1960s and 1970s, and visual and performance art in later decades. Much like his own sculptures, David Medaglia was an auto-creative work of art, never static but continually shifting and reshaping himself. This strategy carried him through over decades of moving from place to place and observing the world through profoundly different perspectives. Even as Medaglia transitioned from kinetic installations to participation art and eventually to impromptu and performance art, he remained constant in his conceptual approach. That art was more about ideas and processes of creation than it was about producing an end product. Indeed, in many cases, the end product was completely ephemeral and evanescent. He naturally sought out others to share in the process. In so doing, he infused them with a belief in their capacity to create. His ability to surprise people and bring them into his unique perspective made him unforgettable to those who met him.